Good afternoon. Well, if you're thinking about the world of 2050 and the future that we're inexorably moving to, there's one reality that I want to reinforce at today's session. No matter how fast you're moving today in respect to policy and adaptation, you're not moving anywhere fast enough because the exponential changes that we're going to see as a result of AI and uh, climate and quantum mean you have to move faster than ever before. Let's look at the policy imperatives, though, first of all, to look at what is going to be driving and reshaping the way we think of eco economy uh, systems uh, in the 2050s. And it starts with uh, climate. And if you look at uh, what's happening in the United States, we saw the California wildfires. The economic estimates are about $300 billion of economic damage. Uh, and these extreme weather events are going to increasingly impinge on modern society. So by 2050, the costs of this globally are going to be about $60 trillion of extreme weather losses and climate damage annually. Think about global GDP at $200 trillion at that point. In the United States, by 2040, the cost of extreme weather events will be more than the annual military budget in the United States. And the US is not prepared for this at all, which is why the US may not be amongst the world's smartest economies in 2050. This is not just about adapting to extreme weather conditions, it's also about our environment today with air pollution and so forth. Eight million people died last year as a result of poor air quality. 99% of the human uh, species is subject to this. This is something we can't ignore. As we increase industrialization and the application of technology like A AI, there's a real risk here. So we need to build infrastructure resilience. We need to adapt. The smartest economies, the fastest growing economies of the world in 2050 will be those that have deployed large scale next generation technologies to make their economy much more efficient, but also climate resilient and AI powered. Food insecurity is gonna be a major theme in the 2050s. 30% of the world's population is gonna suffer food security problems. And this is not going to be just in developing nations. Today, the southern border problem in the US is driven in part by climate issues and food security. This in turn is gonna drive a global boom in eco-refugees, people affected by climate because of food scarcity and so forth. Some of the estimates are even higher than 1.2 billion, which is the mean estimate. Some are as high as 1.6 billion. How do we cope with a billion eco-refugees on the planet using our current system? The answer is, the free market does not have a solution for this. So we have to abandon current economic thinking in the 2050s to have a chance at dealing with this, or else a billion people are gonna die. Now, part of the, the problem also is that around the world, we're not seeing population growth. Why is this a problem? We know, historically speaking, in the 20th century, there are two ways to create core economic growth in the economy. One is to have babies, and that increases consumption and middle-class growth. The second is to have immigrants come in, you know, and, and grow the economy that way. But we know, looking at you know, Europe and the United States right now, where immigration sits in terms of policy. And this is even before we start talking about longevity treatments, which will be widely accessible in the 2050s. And we'll start to have the expectation of people living much longer lives. Again, current healthcare systems are about 15% of GDP, and those costs will double by the 2050s unless you apply uh, large scale automation in the healthcare system and which is gonna be necessary for longevity in itself. But think about how longevity might change the way we view the world. If you're gonna to live to 130, how do you change your approach to your career? Maybe you stay in university until you're in your 40s or 50s because you're gonna be quite young still. It changes the way society is gonna operate. 
But automation and AI are going to drive massive efficiency of scale. It's going to improve resource efficiency. It's going to get us much closer to the type of sustainability we need for the human species to survive. But this has also got some challenges with it. Let's hear what Eric Schmidt said about the arrival of non-human intelligence on the planet. How do you see all of this? Well, first, I hate to tell you, but I think this stuff is underhyped. Underhyped. Not overhyped. Because the arrival of intelligence of a non-human form is really a big deal for the world. And you think it's here? It's coming, it's here, it's about to happen. It happens in stages. If you look how, at the, how, how quickly, though? I mean, well, it, uh, I, you, we used to say 20 years. Now within five. Within uh, five. And the reason is the scaling laws for these systems are continuing to go up without any loss or degradation of power. So within five years, you're going to have dominant capabilities for artificial intelligence embedded in major parts of society, which means we have to work collaboratively with AI. And not just AI like we think of it today, but AI that today can ace any human cognitive test we throw at it. So within five years, artificial intelligence is going to be challenging our philosophies, our policies, our approaches, and arguing with humans over the right way to move forward. So collaborative intelligence is critical. There's two types of people in the world today. Right? Those that are using artificial intelligence to retrain themselves, reframe their career, improve their business, that's the first type. The second are those that are going to be displaced by the first type. So it's not just AI where we're going to see massive scientific advances. Quantum computing is getting to the point of long-term feasibility as well, especially with chips like Google's Willow chip that was uh, announced just a couple of months ago. What does this mean? Well, it also means a complete change in we th the way we think about public se sector infrastructure and cybersecurity. Have you heard of the concept of Q-Day? Q-Day is a day when all existing RSA encryption will be rendered moot by uh, quantum algorithms. We would need quantum-proof algorithms to keep our systems safe in the future. When is this going to happen? Within the next five years. The banking system that we have today will not be safe. The gov government communications, military communications, these sorts of things, unless they're post-quantum encrypted with polymorphic encryption, won't be safe. We don't have decades to sort this out. We have just years. What this means is the world is getting ready for humanless corporations, using technology to eliminate human capital and human labor from the workforce through efficiency gains. In the United States, the dock worker strike a couple of months ago was all about AI. 80% of the ports in China today are autonomous. The dock workers in the United States demanded 20 years protection for their human jobs versus artificial intelligence. This is an economy ready to go into obsolescence because they're not ready to adapt. China in the 2050s will be the world's largest economy. China could surpass the United States as early as the late 2030s as a result of their approach to restructuring around artificial intelligence and technology. But this becomes the building blocks of next generation uh, econo economic systems. Machine to machine agency economies built off large scale automation. And of course, by 2055, 60% uh, of global economic output will be from BRICS nations. Brazil, India, and China being three of the four top economies in the world. So the most important trading block is going to be mostly BRICS using digital currencies like the CBDC to operate cross-border trade. But there are some light at the end of the tunnel from these fractious changes. First of all, 
energy is going to be broadly available. We talk about powering data centers and AI and the energy demands. By 2050, we'll mostly have solved that through next generation nuclear, fusion technology, and of course, renewables. We're going to need grid level storage for renewable energy, but we may look at alternative so solutions, like even beaming solar energy from space using microwaves. This technology is now feasible because of the lower cost to orbit. Healthcare is going to have to move to a data-based initiative. If not, healthcare costs are going to balloon and longevity is going to uh, disappear as a potential. So this means better diagnostics with AI. It means doctors being trained to use artificial intelligence instead of using their base knowledge. Why? Because every year, half a million medical journals are generated and no human doctor can absorb that information adequately. We're going to see technology used to augment humans in the 2050s, not only to improve our longevity, but maybe including artificial intelligence capabilities right in our brain with brain-computer interfaces and so forth. This is going to be possible in the future. But the largest polluter on the planet today isn't fossil fuel, it's commercial farming. So we have to radically change the way we produce food, not only to reduce uh, a damage to the environment, but also deal with the food security problem that's going to come. Homelessness with the eco-refugees can be solved with technologies like 3D printing, again pioneered in the UAE most recently. And every child is going to have their own AI teacher in the 2050s, rather than the type of education system we have today. It's going to be much more personalized, focusing on things like that. Carbon capture is going to be one of the biggest industries on the planet. In fact, climate adaptation will represent up to 40% of global GDP in the 2050s. So this will be the largest industry on the planet. Uh, and that's good because all of the jobs we've lost to automation can go into climate mitigation and climate resilience, such as building seawall defenses, moving people from areas affected. 570 capital cities around the planet will have to have a plan because they exist on coastlines. Miami in the United States is done. It's not going to survive. Where do we put all those people from Miami? Where do we move them to? We need a plan and the plan will need to be in place by 2050. Which means that the type of economic thinking and systems that we have in the future are going to be focused not on earning a living to survive, because automation will fix those problems, it will be focused on real meaning. Yes, climate resilience, but helping humans adapt and find real meaning and passion in our existence. So, economies that are smart will also be climate resilient. They will have adapted and optimized their uh, infrastructure to cope with increasing sea levels, increasing temperatures, and food scarcity issues. But business as usual, on our current system of capitalist thinking and our current policy structure, according to studies like the Beyond Limits to Growth and other uh, research we've done, shows that in a world with AI where we can exponentially grow our production capabilities, unless we think differently, we're going to push ourselves to extinction. So what's the core value system of 2050 economics? It'll be about creating real meaning. And the policy and technologies we are deploying in this scenario are going to be designed not to keep our current system of economics going, but a complete transformation in the philosophy of humanity. Because by 2050, we'll realize that capitalism doesn't have the tools to solve the problems we have. And government is going to be highly automated. So policy is going to be implemented in code. But you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. And this is the biggest shift that's going to occur in the 2040s and the 2050s as we adapt. But AI is key to enabling us, giving us the tools to adapt to these changes very rapidly. But that requires extremely agile thinking, extremely agile culture. And the more we try and defend the current system, the more likely it is we're going to face economic peril. So the 2050s 
have massive opportunities for the planet and for humanity, but only if we learn to think very differently about the future. Thank you very much for your time today.